Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, I'll go over in the next 20 minutes uh, what we have in the last 10 years and maybe a look ahead for the next five years on management in the invasive EP laboratory for atrial fibrillation. Uh, disclosures, uh, uh, I'll point out any uh, relationships I have during the talk. Now when you meet a patient with atrial fibrillation, they have some questions in their mind, whether they voice it or not. And they are very difficult to answer uh, even today. You know, is atrial fibrillation, does it increase mortality? Do any treatments that we have actually decrease this risk? And despite all the advances that I'll go over, I should mention that none of these are really answered uh, at this uh, particular point in time. We do know that on balance, there is very little that separates a rate control approach from a rhythm controlled approach. In other words, from mortality, from stroke reduction, they are equivalent approaches. But what I'm going to cover is that common patient who remains symptomatic from atrial fibrillation despite the best attempts at rate control. So they're still having symptoms and come to us for treatment. Now, unfortunately, medical therapy by and large has been a failure for atrial fibrillation. It's for two reasons. One is any drug uh, that we use today, there's significant risk of proarrhythmia. And of the commonly used drugs for atrial fibrillation, the risk of recurrence uh, remains very high even when follow-up is just for a year or two. Because of this, the interest in the invasive approaches for atrial fibrillation, and I think the landmark change, the change that prompted this whole field was the realization that atrial fibrillation really is two different diseases. There's one disease that starts atrial fibrillation, the trigger for atrial fibrillation. And in some patients, there is the second disease of whatever it is that maintains atrial fibrillation. We know as a result of this, we have two forms of atrial fibrillation, one which comes and goes where we use therapy to identify and treat the trigger for atrial fibrillation. And the second is this disease of persistent atrial fibrillation where most of the recent advances have tried to focus. Now triggers for atrial fibrillation, we know now are really not in the atrium themselves the vast majority of the time. They are related to some neighbor of the atri atrium very often the pulmonary veins. Now, it remains something of a mystery what it is in the pulmonary veins that really gives rise to atrial fibrillation. And perhaps the leading ideas that have stayed are disease as a result of movement, fibrosis uh, near the ostium of the pulmonary vein, or possibly the smooth muscles, the venular smooth muscle itself is what gives rise, like it does in some other uh, body structures, for an arrhythmia that then propagates to the atrium. Now, I always show one intracardiac tracing to any general cardiology audience, and it's this one. It's the one from my first case of atrial fibrillation ablation. It's fairly striking what happened here. You see atrial fibrillation and then sinus rhythm. One would think that a cardioversion has been done. And in fact, we see the same when we put electrodes in the heart, atrial fibrillation, normal. But these electrodes that were in the pulmonary vein continue to fibrillate. What was done at the time of this conversion is electrical isolation just ablation around the pulmonary vein that disconnected this pulmonary vein from the rest of the atrium. A second major advance was understanding 
that when we take a catheter and put it inside a pulmonary vein in patients with atrial fibrillation, if that vein is a trigger for atrial fibrillation, even when the person is in sinus rhythm, we have an abnormal electrical signal from that vein. From a practical perspective, this was a major advance because now we didn't have to see the vein producing the problem. There was this electrical signature that said that I know to produce atrial fibrillation. And ablation approaches then began targeting anatomically the pulmonary vein. So if this substrate that's causing the arrhythmia is in the veins, then ablation in some kind of circular fashion, importantly done in the atrium, then disarticulates this vein, and then we notice those electrical signals, the abnormal electrical signals disappear at the end of ablation with only the normal signals remaining. So this became a viable endpoint in the EP laboratory to know that we have at least treated this one source of atrial fibrillation. And overall, this is a therapy that benefits patients who have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, where the problem is the trigger for atrial fibrillation. We address this in the pulmonary veins, and the majority of patients, we get a satisfactory result. Now, it became clear very soon that it's not only the pulmonary veins. And in fact, just about any thoracic vein can produce atrial fibrillation, probably not except for the inferior vena cava. Some common sites include the superior vena cava, especially the area in between that and the right superior pulmonary vein. Example from one of my patients, after ablating the pulmonary veins, noted recurrent atrial fibrillation, and a catheter placed inside the superior vena cava noted the earliest site of activation that was then targeted for ablation. The left superior vena cava, as you know in adults, remains as a small venous remnant between the pulmonary veins and the left atrial appendage. This is the vein of Marshall, the left superior vena cava remnant, and this vein also, like the pulmonary veins, can trigger atrial fibrillation. We target this today mostly with an approach that involves ablation on the endocardial surface just adjacent to this vein of Marshall tissue. So today's procedure in a patient with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, often it's not only isolating the pulmonary veins, but at least investigating and possibly ablating other thoracic veins, including this superior vena cava and remnants of the left superior vena cava. Now, two challenges remain. Uh, one is we realize that this approach does not work in a satisfactory manner in patients with persistent atrial fibrillation. The second is we have issues related to the invasive nature of these approaches and the production of complications. I'll briefly review advances in dealing with these two present difficulties. Now, in the early experience, a major problem, uh, perhaps in up to 8% of patients with ablation for atrial fibrillation, was narrowing of the pulmonary vein or occlusion of the pulmonary vein. This was a very uh, difficult problem to treat once it developed, and it had to do mostly with where the ablation procedure is done. We know thermal injury to the endothelium produces proliferation. We also know that when ablation is done in muscle, it produces a little aneurysmal dilation. Once this was appreciated, keeping the ablation more in the muscular portion where there is significant muscle uh, greatly decreased the chance of having this complication. Now, the second major complication where I think we have understood more about now is damage to the esophagus. A few patients with atrial fibrillation ablation develop a fistula 
between the atrium and the esophagus. Now, the main reason for this is the esophagus is an immediate posterior neighbor of the left atrium. And with our desire to avoid the pulmonary veins, our ablations became increasingly more likely to be in the neighborhood of the anterior wall of the esophagus. But we do know separating those structures is a pericardial recess, the oblique sinus of the pericardium, and approaches that have targeted either separating using this pericardial recess, the esophagus and the atrium, and more importantly, understanding that it's not a hole that we create with ablation, but it's just thermal injury to the anterior wall of the esophagus. So monitoring for this and using echocardiography and limiting the energy delivery to the posterior wall of the left atrium when we visualize the esophagus nearby uh, has significantly reduced this complication. Now perhaps the most feared complication of any left-sided ablation procedure is the chance that a thrombus will form on the catheter. This is from one of my own patients about 10 years ago. You can imagine I had some palpitation when I saw this thrombus developing with intracardiac ultrasound. Fortunately, using a extraction tool, it was possible to remove this clot in its entirety, but significant research has focused on can we avoid this complication. This is a, a um, idea that has developed at Mayo Clinic and is being tested in uh, patients. This is based on the fact that heparin cannot pre prevent this coagulum, which is really heat-related denaturation of fibrinogen. The idea involves placing a small negative charge using a specially designed circuit on the catheter while delivering ablation energy. The negatively charged fibrinogen is either repelled or stabilized, making it less available for heat-related change and thrombus formation. Example from studies showing the difference when a charge is kept on otherwise smooth surface catheters. Now the biggest challenge today though is understanding what do we do in the diseased atrium. Atrium is enlarged, diastolic dysfunction, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, valvular disease. In these patients, there is disarray of the atrial myocardium with interspersed fibrosis. Is it possible to use an invasive approach to actually make this atrium better uh, at the present time? Well, some of the limitations have to do with the fact that ablation involves producing its own disease in the atrium. Ablation is thermal damage uh, to the atrial tissue itself. And research has focused on avoiding damage to the atrium while improving the electrical stability of this atrial myocardium. One of the issues when we do our ablation procedures is the atrial anatomy is complicated. It is not a smooth geometric surface and some recent advances have helped us in understanding where exactly we are ablating. Real-time three-dimensional tagging of where the catheter is located and also uh, sensors on the catheter tip that tell us whether we are actually making contact with the wall of the atrium while we are making these ablation lesions. Important investigation that hopefully will reach the clinical laboratory looks at actually visualizing the thermal energy heating of the atrium. At present, we don't have any way of knowing how deep the heat that we are generating in the tissue is, but looking at some techniques, including infra real-time infrared uh, imaging, can uh, perhaps help to uh, get rid of that deficit.
The biggest change in the last couple of years has been exploring cryo energy rather than radio frequency energy for ablation. I'll just say that the clinically relevant tool today is balloon catheters that are placed at the ostium of the pulmonary vein for cryo energy delivery. Now these have made, I think, easier the ablation approach for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation but they fundamentally have not offered us a treatment option in the difficult case, and that is the diseased atrium. The most exciting uh, recent advance is the discovery that during atrial fibrillation, even though the whole atrium is perhaps even permanently fibrillating, there are small rotors or drivers that are relatively fixed, at least in experimental studies, that can potentially be targeted to terminate and prevent recurrence of atrial fibrillation. A lot of excitement in that area, and a very closely allied area where I have some personal interest is targeting not the muscle, but the nerves, the ganglia that lie behind the heart, the so-called small brain of the atrium. The idea here is that by targeting these ganglia, which have been traditionally done by endocardial approaches, we can change the electrical characteristics in such a way that the heart will not fibrillate. We have explored an epicardial approach since these ganglia are actually located epicardially using specially designed catheters that deliver direct current rather than, uh, uh, rather than radio frequency energy to cause electrolysis that damages these nerves and reduces the likelihood of atrial fibrillation in the tissue. A very de recent discovery has been new cells that have been found in the region of the pulmonary veins. These cells are pacemaker-like cells found widespread in the gut called the interstitial cells of Kahal. They are separate from the nerves and represent probably a significant advance in understanding targets for treating atrial fibrillation. Finally, a few experimental approaches, biological therapies for atrial fibrillation. These have been tried extensively this last year. One approach has been injecting uh, a biological equivalent of drugs that affect the potassium channel and reduce the likelihood of maintaining atrial fibrillation. Other approach have been injecting cells that induce fibrosis and these fibrosis like cells then effectively are like ablation but without damaging existing myocardium. Non-invasive approaches, something to look forward to in the next five to 10 years. The early major advance occurred about a year ago, and that is using a unique energy source that is somewhere between a carbon and proton beam that has the differentiation to target either just the ganglia or just the atrial myocardium without damage in experimental studies to the esophagus. And it is possible by using such a cloud to produce a lesion-like circumferential ablation around the pulmonary veins. So if I summarize, uh, five years ago, our major advances were understanding that symptomatic patients do have a good treatment option with an ablation catheter when their atrial fibrillation is paroxysmal. Since then, our advances have been to prevent complications, and here large success in preventing pulmonary vein stenosis and esophageal damage. And then the remaining challenge, can we treat substrate-based atrial fibrillation, where there are structural abnormalities in the atrium? The unique new approaches involve targeting the so-called rotors, using the autonomic nerves as a target to change refractoriness and conduction, but importantly, without damaging any atrial tissue, and then seeing if we can do this non-invasively with approaches that involve uh, proton or carbon beam radiation.
Thank you very much for your attention.